It is time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Any dissolution of Peel Region will require serious thought and care from this government. There are a lot of moving parts, and uh, billions of dollars are at stake for taxpayers in Brampton, in Mississauga, and in Caledon. But as we've seen, whether it's with Bill 23 or the cancellation of Peel chair elections or the ending of regional planning responsibilities, this Premier has a record of imposing sudden, massive changes on municipalities without consultation or careful review, leaving municipalities and taxpayers to deal with the resulting chaos. How can the people of Peel trust the Premier to get this right? And to reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I, I disagree with the Leader of the Opposition. The Premier has been clear on this issue and what our shared intentions are. Uh, we're committed to working with all of our municipal partners to ensure that they have both the tools and the autonomy uh, to deliver efficient and effective services uh, to their constituents. Uh, this is an issue that's uh, long been discussed uh, within Peel Region. As I said earlier, uh, the Premier has been very clear on his intentions, and we'll have more to say later in the day, Speaker. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, back to the Premier. Last week, we reminded the Premier and the Minister of Municipal Affairs of their promise to make municipalities whole for revenue losses that were caused by Bill 23. We told them that Brampton would need to raise taxes by 80 per cent—80 per cent—to cover these losses. Now they're worried about losing as much as a billion dollars in infrastructure. But the minister seems to forget all about his promise to make municipalities whole. The premier even compared Peel municipalities to beggars seeking a handout. How can Peel residents have any confidence in this restructuring process when the premier and the minister have shown them such disrespect? The minister of Affairs and Housing. Uh, speaker, the, the region of Peel has some of the largest and fastest growing communities in our province. We have been very clear that we will continue to work with them. We recently appointed uh, an auditor for all four uh, Peel communities uh, with a very clear vision that we want to set those municipalities up for success. All three of the municipalities, Mississauga, Brampton and Caledon, all are part of our expansion of strong mayor powers. All of them have been very, very clear back to us. They've committed to our housing targets, and they're ready for success. And the final supplementary. I encourage the minister to go listen to the people of Brampton. Yeah. Their municipality is indeed growing at an extraordinary rate. But time and time again, this government makes Bramptonians Order. pay promises but Order. delivers nothing but half measures. I get why people Order. are worried about this government's latest plan. They deserve better. In 2019, the government announced a regional government review. Three months of consultations, and the review received over 8,500 written submissions, but then the government suddenly dropped the whole idea. The report and the recommendations have been kept secret ever since. Just so Peel residents and other Ontarians have access to all the relevant information, will the Premier order the release of the 2019 report? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, Speaker. You know, you know one thing that the Leader of the Opposition didn't talk about? The results of last year's election. Yeah. Uh, I wonder why. Can you imagine that now, right now, all of those seats in Peel Region are government seats. Yep. They're all blue. They're all blue. So, so the Leader of the Opposition, you know, let's, let's face it, there's a bit of revisionist history over on the, uh, on the benches over there. Just we we the will math, continue. Actually to work with our outstanding Peel Region MPPs here, here, here. in the government. We'll continue to work with our three great mayors and those great councils uh, in Caledon, Brampton and Mississauga, and we want to give a clear message to the people who live in Peel Region. No matter whether you live in Caledon or Brampton or Mississauga, we want to ensure that the process results in those same 
response Frontline services that those people expect today yep. and they'll expect in the future. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. And before I go to my next question, let me just say I wonder how those people in Brampton are going to feel next election when their taxes have gone up 80 per cent under this government. 80 per cent. Order. Oh, yeah. It's coming. Order. On September 15. Order. Speaker, side, come to order. On September 15, 2022, a company controlled by Michael Rice of the Rice Group bought 687 acres of protected farmland in King Township. Less than two months later, the government announced that this property would be removed from the Greenbelt. But now we've learned that Mr. Rice discussed the development of this land with King Township and South Lake Health officials in June before he bought the land, and perhaps even as early as January of last year. It makes no sense for Mr. Rice to propose the development of protected Greenbelt land he did not even own yet, unless, and my question is to the Premier, did someone in the government tip him off about the Greenbelt plan? Reply, the government has seated. Shocking, Mr. Speaker, that Somebody was talking about building a new hospital in York Region, the new South Lake Hospital. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we were actually talking about building a new South Lake Hospital before the last election, yes. Mr. Speaker. It's been no secret. We've never made a secret of the fact that the people of York Region, especially South Lake, needed to be rebuilt. I just don't understand how it is that the Leader of the Opposition is not aware of this because we have not tried to hide the fact. In fact, we went into an election telling the people of the province of Ontario that we were going to make $50 billion worth of investments in health care because we had to rebuild a health care system that was left so sorely lacking by the Liberal and NDP coalition, which ignored health care for 15 years. It is no secret. But Welcome to the party. Perhaps now you will consider voting in favour of this massive investment now that it's no longer a secret to the supplementary question. Speaker, it's not about what this government says is going to be built or not. It's about who has access to this government to get these favours. That's what this is about. Shortly before that June meeting. Luca Bucci, the Chief of Staff to the Minister of Municipal, Housing, uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing, left the ministry and took a job as the new CEO of the Ontario Home Builders Association. The president of the OHBA at the time was Bob Schickendans, whose company owned the King Township property that would then be sold to Michael Rice on September 15th and then removed from the Greenbelt less than two months later. Follow along here, Speaker. Did Mr. Bucci or any other government official know about any of the Greenbelt removals prior to September 15, 2022? Governor. Mr. Speaker, as important as it is that you follow along, I think it's very clear that the people of Ontario followed along in the last election, right? She says it's not important about what gets built and what doesn't get built in the province of Ontario. Well, I disagree. It actually is important what gets built and what doesn't get built, because under the Liberal and NDP coalition, nothing got built, Mr. Speaker. That's why our hospitals were crumbling. That's why we didn't have subways for over 30 years. There is a delegation here from Great Britain. They managed to get subways built in London. We had to wait 30 years for Toronto, for crying out loud. But you know who got the job done? This Minister of Transportation, this Premier, they got subways built in Ontario. So I would say Order. to the Leader of the Opposition, it does matter what gets built and what gets uh, and what is not built. And under this government, things get built, and when they're in charge, nothing happens. Um, speaker, back to the Premier. Back to the Premier. The Conservatives' narrative is totally off here. They better get their story straight. Yeah. <laughs> Last week, the Narwhal Order. reported Order. that officials Order. in the Premier's office Government were aware side, come of the changes to, to the Green Belt as early as August. And Michael Rice was pitching a development proposal for his soon-to-be-acquired Green Belt land as early as June or maybe even January of last year. 
The timeline here doesn't make any sense. Why did the Premier and the Minister tell the Integrity Commissioner that they only knew about the Greenbelt removal scheme in November when the Premier's inner circle clearly knew long before then? Thank you. Again, like, the Leader of the Opposition suggests that the narrative is off. I suggest that it is the Leader of the Opposition, the NDP, who haven't got on with the narrative, Mr. Speaker. We went to the people of the province of Ontario and said that we were going to continue to build prosperity in the province of Ontario by building roads, highways, new long-term care, by investing in our auto sector, by bringing jobs back to the province of Ontario, and what we have seen is record growth in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. This is an opposition party that went to the people with the message that she's delivering now, and the people of the province of Ontario massively turned their back on that particular party, Mr. Speaker. In fact, they returned the Progressive Conservative Party Order. with a larger majority than when we left. They reduced the opposition by 10 seats. This is a leader of the opposition who ran unopposed for the leadership because nobody else wanted to lead the party, Mr. Speaker. I think we got the narrative right. The economy is showing that we're getting it right, and the people of the province of Ontario. Members will please take their seats. Order. 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 Start the clock. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Uh, Miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, uh, the leadership uh, and the members from the, the from the Ojibwe's of uh, Garden River First Nation traveled here today to enforce a long overdue promise of the 1850 treaty to their people. That that treaty promised them land that Ontario and Canada took, took back for mining, timber, and farming. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, will this government honor the 1850 treaty and give back the land Ontario owes to Garden River First Nation. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for the question, and uh, and uh, let me too welcome uh, uh, the the delegation, the uh, uh, the chiefs, and the entire uh, members of the community that uh, have uh, have come here. Look, we have, uh, I think, a, a very good. Uh, tradition of working with Indigenous uh, partners to ensure that, uh, in fact, I think this government has, uh, has uh, secured more uh, agreements than any other government uh, in the past, but that doesn't suggest that the work is, uh, is done uh, by, uh, by any account, Mr. Speaker. I know this is something that is before the courts right now, and as you would, uh, can appreciate, Mr. Speaker, when something is before the courts, it's very, uh, there's very little more that we can say on, on the matter. But uh, uh, the Premier has said, as the Minister has uh, said, we remain committed to working with Indigenous partners to not only settle uh, land claims across the, the province of Ontario, but ensuring that, uh, our, that Indigenous communities participate in the economic growth because they are the leaders that will help us shape Ontario of the future, Mr. Speaker. Response? They're such an important part of it. We owe them that, Mr. Speaker, and I know that they are as excited to work with us as we are to work with them. Supplementary question. Uh, we need to start talking about self-determination. We need to start talking about self-governance. We need to start talking about treaties, honour the treaties. Speaker, First Nations and Ontario are founding partners in the development of this province. We know that. You know that. The future prosperity for all of us depends on implementing the spirit and intent of the treaties. Again, um, the prosperity of Northern Ontario depends on the respect of those treaties. Does Ontario agree that this means respect for the environment? So any agreed upon development in the North can happen sustainably, responsibly, 
and with the full involvement and the full consent Question. of First Nations. Take your seat. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Look, a, a really, a really good question from the, uh, the member, and I think he hits nail on the head in a, in a lot of respects. Uh, I don't think we need to start uh, working uh, with uh, with First Nations. We need to continue working with uh, First Nations. Uh, I think he has highlighted it on many occasions, as have our partners, uh, uh, Speaker, that it, this is a partnership. Uh, uh, this is a nation-to-nation -nation, uh, discussion. Uh, speaker, uh, uh, First Nations are, in many respects, uh, not only our partners, but they are our teachers when it comes to how we can ensure the economic prosperity, not only of Northern Ontario, but all of, all of Ontario. So we will continue to work with, uh, with our partners, uh, 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 not only First Nations community, but across, uh, across the province of Ontario, to ensure that as the, uh, the economic uh, riches of the North uh, uh, which have become so important in the economic development, not only of Southern Ontario, Fonts. but all of Canada, that it is those relationships that, uh, that we have with First Nations community that help guide us and help lead us the way to that economic prosperity that is so important to all Ontarians. Next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Much like the rest of the world, Ontario is experiencing the effects of global economic uncertainty ongoing supply chain disruptions, inflation, and increased interest rates have created financial pressures for people across Ontario. Individuals, families, and businesses are looking to our government for help during these challenging times to provide them with much-needed support so that life is more affordable. They need to see that our government is continuing to focus on legislation, investments, and other initiatives that will provide real relief financially, and that our government has a strong plan for the future. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is continuing to work on behalf of Ontarians during these challenging economic times? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the terrific member from Brantford, Brant, for that question. You know, Mr. Speaker, the people of Ontario re-elected our government with a plan to get it done to keep costs down and to support the people of Ontario while getting roads and hospitals, schools and infrastructure built that Ontario needs. We have a responsible plan to ensure that the province remains on a strong and steady economic path forward. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I was very pleased to see that Moody's, a credit rating agency, has recently changed Ontario's credit from stable to positive. Hey! Mr. Speaker, this reflects our government's commitment to prudent, responsible fiscal management and a strong economy. Response. We have laid a strong foundation on which we will continue to build Ontario. Yeah. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. It is great to hear that our government is consistently introducing measures that will put money back into the pockets of taxpayers and is building up Ontario's future with infrastructure and investments that will benefit everyone. That said, the people of Ontario expect that their government will continue to look for more ways to reduce costs so that life is more affordable. Unlike the previous Liberal government that was out of touch with the people of Ontario, our government must remain committed to focusing on issues that will help to improve everyday life. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the priorities in the 2023 budget will help to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario? Thank you. Mr. Finance. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the, uh, the member for that question. You know, Mr. Speaker, we are making transit more affordable by eliminating double fares for most local transit uh, services in the greater Golden Horseshoe area when commuters are also using GO Transit services. Mr. Speaker, for low-income seniors in Ontario, these uncertain times are even more challenging. That is why we are temporarily doubling the guaranteed annual income system, also known as GAINS, those payments until December of 2023. And, Mr. Speaker, and, Mr. Speaker we are proposing to expand that GAINS program starting in 2024 to 100,000 additional seniors eligible for wow. the program for a 50 percent increase in recipients wow. and do justice benefits so they can deal with inflation, Fonts. Mr. Speaker. 
This all builds on our previous measures, including cutting the gas and fuel tax until December 2023 and eliminating license plate. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Residents of Windsor-Essex are deeply concerned to know that numerous Code Red and Code Blacks have been declared due to shortages of available ambulances and this government's continued systemic underfunding of health care in Ontario. From 2021 to 2022, there was an alarming increase of 4,833 Code Red minutes. Three months into this year, Windsor-Essex is at nearly 900 Code Red minutes, plus another 2,257 Code Black minutes. This is the dangerous reality in Windsor-Essex, and this government continues to fail to address it. Speaker, will the Premier commit today to addressing this disturbing reality and ensure residents in my community have access to timely emergency services when they need it? And to apply, the Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health, Member Frick Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government knows that the status quo is not working, and that is why we've been making all the changes we have, why we introduced the Your Health Act, and why we've got the largest health human resource recruitment, retention, and training initiative in Ontario's history to address any concerns such as the ones the member opposite has mentioned. And recently, in fact, this Tuesday, our Minister of Health and our Minister of Colleges and Universities were in Owen Sound to, to announce a uh, uh, training programs, learn and stay programs, uh, to in, ensure 2,500 post-secondary students in nursing, paramedic and medical te laboratory technology students would get training covered by the government. And what we're doing is making sure that those programs are available. This is building on programs that we announced in March of 2022. And Response. we think that this is part of the solution to make sure that we have the health human resource and make sure that the emergency rooms are operating. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The Mayor and Council of Essex passed a motion this week and have written a letter to the Premier calling for immediate action for our region. Mayor Bondi said, and I quote, We implore the authorities to imply an immediate and comprehensive review of our hospital offload delays and staffing crisis in our front line. Ambulance, ambulance offload processes and hospital volumes are merely two contributing factors. If nothing tangible is done, local families risk experiencing catastrophic consequences." End quote. Speaker, will the Premier immediately address the concerns of the Essex Council and the alarming health care crisis we're experiencing across Windsor-Essex with the increasing Code Reds and Code Blacks? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our government is taking action to ensure Ontarians have access to the care they need. And when it comes to the ambulance offload delays, we have um, a many-step process we put in place. We're returning ambulances to communities faster through the dedicated offload nursing program. We've increased ambulance uh, availability by about 600,000 hours with that program. We're providing timely and appropriate care in community uh, through the expansion of our 911 um, options. We're investing in new technologies through the Central Ambulance Communications Centre, and we're doing all these things to make sure and also helping with uh, transport of non-medically Non, so for medically stable patients, so they don't have to use ambulances, and we're maximizing, as I said, our hu health human resource capacity. Speaker, this year we've increased dedicated offload funding Response. to over $23 million for 27 municipalities, and that's seven additional municipalities receiving that funding for the first time. We're going to continue to make sure that our ambulances can be in the community, not waiting in hospitals, and that our emergency rooms are well staffed. Okay, the next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my, my question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. Uh, many commuters and families, myself included, uh, in my riding at Brampton North rely on the GO Train network to get to downtown Toronto and to travel across the rest of the GTA. Those same commuters and families were left behind when the previous Liberal government broke their promises on GO Transit service. Because of their failed leadership, our government inherited a transit system that was outdated and in need of many improvements. That's why our government must build transit infrastructure that will improve travel, create local jobs, and boost our economy. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is bringing fast and convenient GO Transit services for the people in my riding and across Ontario? The Associate Minister of Transportation. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, Bo Jala Badia question from the member this morning. Shukriya Badia. <laughs> Speaker, make no mistake, we're building the GO network after the Liberals failed to do so. Last week, I joined the Premier and Minister Maul Rooney to announce we recently finished building terrific new infrastructure improvements at Bramley GO and Brampton. Mm -hmm. These fantastic enhancements include a brand new accessible station building, a spacious parking garage with over 2,000 parking spaces and tremendous bus-related infrastructure with a whopping 18 new bus platforms so riders can get off Bramley Go and connect to local Brampton, Brampton Transit with ease. Our upgrades are making Bramley Go an essential hub for 12,200 daily riders that it will have in 20 years' time. Speaker, unlike the opposition who failed to expand the Go network and build transit of any meaningful way, mm -hmm. this government is getting it done for commuters oh. in Ontario. Hey. But, Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, and it's great to see how our government is improving the GO Transit network as it will better help to better connect people and communities. A, uh, a new and improved Bramley GO station will offer riders better and more convenient service. The people of Ontario are looking forward to a modernized GO Transit system that will meet our transit needs for years to come. Our government must continue to build Ontario by delivering on our commitment to bring relief and new opportunities to transit users. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on the progress our government is making on expanding the GO Transit network to get it done for commuters all across our province? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Speaker, uh, let's be clear. This government is taking the biggest transit expansion plan in history at 70 and a half billion dollars and making it a, rea a reality for the commuters in this province. This includes the GO expansion program. The member from Waterloo heckles but votes against two-way all-day GO in her own riding after asking it for it for decades. But, Speaker, we continue. Order. Mr. the floor. Thank you, Speaker. Despite the heckling of the opposition who opposes transit, even in their own ridings, we're getting it done. For example, Millican Go train station has a fine new east platform and a south tunnel for riders. Speaker, that's not the only enhancement we're bringing. We're also bringing enhancements such as a second track and platform, canopies and integrated shelters, a renovated existing, we're renovating the existing platform and two brand new pedestrian tunnels with elevators, Speaker. It's not just about expanding the grid. It's about making it more affordable. It's about making the rider experience more enjoyable. Spons. Speaker, this government is getting it done for commuters in this province. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la ministre de la Santé. My question for the Minister of Health. Uh, has a very hard time meeting its 24 hours a day, seven days a week obligation to their emergency department. They serve many seniors, many Amish and Mennonites families who do not drive. They know vulnerable people are dependent upon them. Chelsea's hospital face human resources shortages. They need more resources. They need this minister's help. Hospitals are the biggest responsibility of a minister of health. We all know that the minister is all in when it comes to helping investors build our private clinics that we don't need. But the people of Chelsea who are here today wants to know what this minister is going to do to help public hospital like Chelsea, who is struggling right now. Here, here. Members, please take their seats. And to respond, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Thank you to the member for the question. It's, it's very interesting. Every day, you're all talk, talk, talk about yeah. more doctors and nurses. But every time you get up to vote, it's no, no, no. Bill 60, every one of you voted last week against Addition, adding additional nurses, PSWs, doctors to the system. This week, I was with the Minister of Health where we kicked off the announcement for the Learn and Stay grant, which will actually affect your community through Cambrian College and through Laurentian University. We've already seen 1,300 students register for this program. So it's amazing to see that the nurses. You know, you vote against Bill 60, but you have a chance today to stand up and vote for the budget, which will again include more doctors and nurses. So I ask you today to stand up and vote and support the budget so we can see Response. more health human resources added to the system. Stop the clock for a second. Once again, I'll remind the members to please make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. Start the clock. Supplementary question, the member for 
Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. One of the question back to the health minister. One of two operating rooms at the general campus of the Ottawa Hospital was closed last Saturday when a nurse had to call in sick. That meant one less OR for major trauma incidents in our city. But you know what was open, Speaker, last Saturday? The for-profit corporation that's been operating at the Riverside campus of the Ottawa Hospital and poaching nurses from our existing hospital infrastructure. Now, this minister and this government, I'm going to assume, order. is going to assist. There's no link between these things. Order. But I Niagara believe West, the president of the nurses at the Ottawa Hospital, Rachel Muir, who says there is. So, Speaker, will today be the day, finally, that this government comes to grips with its obsession of for-profit health care and how it is hurting our hospitals? Here, here, here. The member for Niagara West will come to order. The Minister of Colleges and Universities can reply. Thank you to the member again for the, the, uh, the question. And you know, we're talking about health human resources and including Communism adding more additional health human resources, more doc. The member for Kitchener Centre will come to order. Oh, sorry. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. I think he knows what he said. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, we're talking about adding additional health human resources to the field, more doctors, more nurses, more PSWs, and yet every opportunity we bring forward, the opposition, Liberals and NDPs, vote against these every single time. We have record numbers of students right now who are wanting to become nurses. We're adding incentives like the new Learn and Stay program. Uh, investments in hospitals, long-term care centers. Students want to join the, the health sector, and yet every opportunity that comes before you, Order. you vote it down. You talk about wanting more doctors and nurses, and yet Response. every time it's no, no, no. So Today we vote for Budget shame. 2023, and I hope that all members in this House stand and support adding additional health human resources. Once again, stop the clock, please. One more time, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. Will I say it again? The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, earlier this year, the emergency room in Chesley, Ontario had its hours limited from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday. Chesley residents who have emergencies outside of you know, bankers' hours, according to this government, they're just out of luck. Coupled with our family doctor shortage, Ontarians are left with fewer and fewer options, and residents of Chesley are understandably angry. Last month, hundreds of uh, Chesley residents prote protested the ER's extended closures, even organizing the petition that will be read in the record later today. Mr. Speaker, the people of Chesley have had enough of this government's inaction uh, as the province's health care crisis sweeps through their community. Will the Premier drop his appeal to Bill 124, address the staffing crisis, adequately fund our hospitals, and keep emergency rooms open across Ontario? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, honestly, like, it's bad enough when the NDP asked questions because they held the balance of power, but the Liberals were actually in power for 15 years across the province of Ontario. And what did they do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now, when the NDP were in power, they reduced, they reduced the acute care beds in our hospitals down to 18,000. They took yep. thousands of yep. beds offline. God. The Liberals then doubled down, Mr. Speaker, but then they went even further. They actually cut the health care spending across the province of Ontario while they were in power and while there was a federal government, a conservative government, that was increasing funding by 6 per cent a year to health care. That is the record of the Liberals. The Liberals helped bring this province to its knees. They underfunded small hospitals across the province of Ontario. And now this member Boss. has the nerve to get up and say, do something about it. Well, we are. We started on day one by making investments, not only in our small and medium hospitals, but by rebuilding them and by bringing thousands of additional health care workers on. Thank you for taking a seat. The supplementary question. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know what this government's done? This government's ensured that the ER in Alexandria has been closed 38 times from last year to this year. The government's ensured that the ER in Perth was closed for three straight weeks last July. They ensured that the emergency room at the Mulfour Hospital in Ottawa was closed on weekends last summer, Mr. Speaker. That's the record of this government. They're, they're, they continue Order. to blame. They continue to blame others after five years in office, having not actually accomplished a whole heck of a lot. The health care crisis in Chesley, the health care crisis in Chesley, is not a one-off. It's merely the tip of the iceberg. Unless this government changes course, it will happen again and again and again. Mr. Speaker, for the people in Chesley without a family doctor who can't drive a half an hour when they're having a heart attack and need emergency room access, Mr. Speaker, what does the Premier recommend they do Question. in a medical emergency? Government House Leader. Well, the people of the province of Ontario did the right thing in, in 2018 when they elected a Conservative government to fix the bungling of 15 years of Liberals. How dare this member get up and talk about small-town Ontario? This is a member whose government closed schools in small-town Ontario. This is a member whose government starved small-town Ontario hospitals to death, Mr. Speaker, so that they could take funding from small town Ontario and put it into hospitals in their own ridings. They closed down acute care beds, they laid off nurses, they didn't build long term care, Mr. Speaker. That is the record of the Liberal Party. What have we done? You want to know what we've done? We're building 50 brand new hospitals across the province of Ontario. We're expanding them. We said to our small hospitals, Hospitals in small town Ontario said it is absolutely incredible Spons. that for 15 years they starved you. We took their budgets and we equaled them to what is happening in big Ontario urban communities. We're hiring more doctors with more doc with more medical schools, more nurses. Government side will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the, mem the member for Scarborough Aging Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Red Tape Reduction. After 15 years of previous Liberal government, Ontario was left with the highest regulatory burden in the country. Companies found themselves tangled up in, in endless and complicated regulations. What's worse is that under the watch of the Liberals, more than 300,000 manufacturing jobs packed up and left Ontario. That's why in 2018, Ontario's, Ontarians entrusted our government to clean up the mess that was left behind. The people of our province expect that our government will implement measures that will pave the way for better services and make it easier for businesses to invest in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please share some of the steps our government has taken to make businesses more competitive in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Red Tape Production. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the member from Scarborough Aging Court for that important question. We all know the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, obviously spent 15 years uh, creating unnecessary burdens for people in the province of Ontario. As a matter of fact, Ontario had the largest regulatory burden in the country, Mr. Speaker, when we took over in 2018. But what have we done since 2018, Mr. Speaker? We brought forward 10 different pieces of legislation in this House to help reduce that regulatory burden. Mr. Speaker, 10 pieces of legislation that have helped reduce over 16 thousand different red tape requirements that Ontarians and businesses have to face in our province, Mr. Speaker, and we continuously encourage, of course, Ontarians and businesses to bring forward ideas that we can work on and make life uh, easier for everyone, Mr. Speaker. I also want to point out that we Once. have not to date received a single idea from the members of opposite, Mr. Speaker, simply because I don't think they care about red tape production. Thank 
Thank you, Minister. The speaker, it is always good news for the people of Ontario when our government is streamlining processes by getting rid of outdated and unnecessary regulations. Our government continues to prove that there are innovative solutions that save people and businesses time and money. To date, the work of Ministry of Red Tape Reduction has saved businesses nearly $700 million in annual compliances costs. However, our government must continue to look for more opportunities to reduce regulatory burdens to Question. make it easier for Ontarians to access services. Speaker, can the minister please share how our government's latest red tape reduction bill will do more to make life easier for people and businesses in Ontario. Mr. Red Tape Reduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for the important question again, Mr. Speaker. I was proud to introduce our 10th red tape reduction, Mr. Speaker, bill uh, called the Rest of Red Tape Stronger Economy Act, Mr. Speaker. If passed, of course, it will help get broadband built faster across our province in various communities, Mr. Speaker. It'll help businesses and nonprofit organizations adopt digital meetings and other virtual practices, Mr. Speaker. It will protect electricity ratepayers from incurring the cost of fines imposed on utility companies, Mr. Speaker. And those are just few of the highlights uh, from the latest bill that we have before the House. Mr. Speaker, in fact, I'm proud to say that this was the largest piece of legislation that our government has brought in so far in this session, Mr. Speaker. Why? Because we understand unnecessary burden, unnecessary red tape is holding our economy, holding Bonds. our provinces back, and we will continue to work hard each and every day to eliminate those unnecessary barriers, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This week, the FAO report confirmed what experts have been warning the government for about some time. The implementation of the $10 a day child care program is under threat because of low pay and poor working conditions. The average ECE worker only stays in the child care sector for just three years. Does the government's plan include creating not-for-profit spaces with good-paying jobs? Mr. Education. Mr. Speaker, the greatest single threat to affordable child care is the ideological aversion of New Democrats and Liberals that would have opposed 30 per cent of child care operators for being in the deal because you oppose the inclusion of for-profit child care because they're so blinded by ideology instead of practical reductions in savings for working people in the province of Ontario. This Premier got a deal done, not any deal, a better deal, with a billion more dollars on the table, an extra year of funding guarantees, and yes, Mr. Speaker, a commitment to increase increase wages for the very workers who make a difference in our in our child care centers. Mr. Speaker, we're increasing wages by a dollar per hour per year. We instituted for the first time a wage floor and we made a commitment. The parliamentary assistant has been leading a consultation to go even further. Let's work together to make child care affordable. This year, the average rate went from $46 a day on Spons. average to $23 a day. 50% savings. A major step forward. Let's do this for families in Ontario. Supplementary question. Speaker, the FAO estimates that over 220,000 additional spaces will be required to fulfill the demand for a $10 child care, daycare. With 16,000 child care workers needing to be hired by 2026 in order to meet the demand, early childhood educators are leaving the field faster than, than they can be trained. We've been urging the government to create an Early Years and Child Care Workforce Advisory Commission. Will the government commit today to prioritizing a $10 a day child care and make sure that child care is a career that workers want to stay in? Education. Appreciate the question from the members opposite. We can agree that ECs play a critical role. It is a profession that is worth entering uh, with great opportunity. And of course, while we're increasing their wages and strengthening the um, supports we're providing for the workers. We're also putting an emphasis on reduction in fees and increase of access. Mr. Speaker, under the former Liberal government, one of the legacies perhaps New Democrats and Progressive Conservatives could agree 
was the indefensible increase of 400 percent in child care fees for working parents. It became a choice of staying home or working. It undermined labour market participation of women in the economy. We're finally getting this done, but we stood up to the federal government for a better deal that includes more affordability, more spaces and more federal investment. And Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to stand with those workers, stand with families, reduce fees, increase access and increase the wages of the people who make a difference Bonds. in the life of our kids in Ontario. Okay, next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Oh, great minister. Yes. Ontario's greenhouse-grown fruit, vegetables and flowers account for a significant contribution to Ontario's agri-food sector. Through implementing new technology and innovation within the sector, Ontario's greenhouse continue to be at the forefront of the agri-food sector. Consistent, reliable, premium quality products continue to put Ontario on the map as a global leader and a universally trusted brand of choice. The economic activity generated by Ontario's greenhouses alone contributes to more than $2.3 billion wow. to Ontario's GDP and have created over 28,000 jobs. Can the minister share what the government is doing to support the growth of this important agri-food business? That's a good question. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the question from the MPP from Peterborough because this is something we need to celebrate. It's really important that people across Ontario understand that Ontario's greenhouse vegetables sector and fresh flower sector actually represent over 81% of Canada's total greenhouse vegetable oh, exports. 81% wow, of exports. We are a food powerhouse in Canada, and we're working with the sector, an all-government approach, to make sure that the right supports are in place. For example, we continue to work with the greenhouse sector and introduce programs like the Grow Ontario Marketing Initiative to help grow markets, not only in Ontario, but around the world. We're working with our colleagues to reduce red tape, introduce research initiatives, and we're working with greenhouses to ensure Response. that when international workers choose to work in Ontario, they have safe co living conditions. For instance, the HEPA filter system that we introduced. You know, the list goes on and on, Speaker, but the important part is the future is Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this week, we welcomed the Ontario Greenhouse Alliance to this House. Yep. Greenhouse-grown flowers generate more than $900 million in wow. farm gate sales in 2021 and continue to innovate to grow this target. The partnership between the Ontario Chapter of Flowers Canada and the Ontario Greenhouse Vegetable Growers, represented by TOGA — yes, it's true, we had a TOGA event — is a formidable economic powerhouse with the ability to truly strengthen Ontario's economy. TOGA's members are protecting crops and flowers from environmental extremes, preserving and recirculating water and nutrients, and growing year-round to ensure that we have safe, local, fresh food supply throughout the year. Can the minister elaborate on how this government Question. is supporting the desire to increase exports of our fresh products? Oh, great. <laughs> minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. And you know, I, I want to touch on the fresh flower market here in Ontario. And, th and thank you to the member opposite from Peterborough for recognizing the toga party that was held here, because the Ontario Greenhouse Alliance has so much to celebrate. And in fact, I was speaking to one grower that specializes in fresh flowers, and I want to quote something that he shared. You know, they, were, they had a really good market leading up to Mother's Day, and not only in Ontario did they satisfy demand across the province, but he also stated that $1 million worth of flowers grown in Ontario was sold into the U.S. market, and I know the finance minister will appreciate this, because selling into the U.S. market translated into $1.35 million returning to Ontario wow. so that we can continue to build Ontario, invest in our greenhouse business, and most importantly, continue to grow good Response. Ontario jobs. And, Speaker, that's exactly why we stand with the members of the Ontario Greenhouse Alliance and farmers across this province to meet market challenges and to help them realize growth opportunities. Next question. Member for Niagara Falls. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. The Fort Erie Racetrack will have their 126th opening day next Tuesday. Right now, they're under attack. 
After reaching an impasse in their attempt to resolve ongoing issues, the Fortery Racetrack filed a grievance with the Canadian Trade Commission for targeted anti-competition behaviour by Woodbine. Woodbine has enforced a strict horse stabling policy and routinely running B-level races as an A-level track at the expense of the Fortery Racetrack. Speaker, will the government step in and have Woodbine end this behaviour to ensure to ensure the future of the Fort Erie track. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member opposite uh, for that question, uh, that very important question. And as the member knows, uh, there has been a complaint uh, filed that he just uh, referenced in front of the uh, Comp uh, Competition Bureau, so I can't get into uh, specifics and, and comment uh, in detailed fashion on that, but I, I will say this. And I think the member opposite uh, knows this, that uh, the previous government was willing uh, and prepared to allow for the collapse of the horse racing industry. And Mr. Speaker, that would have caused the potential loss of 23,000 jobs and 27,000 dead horses, Mr. Speaker. So we are supporting the horse racing industry, Mr. Speaker. In fact, during the pandemic, we negotiated terms to have a long-term funding agreement to provide additional support through a very challenging time for the industry, and this will give the industry time to recover, Mr. Speaker, and preserve local employment and provide support to Ontario's Response. 15 racetracks until 2026. Back to the Premier. Woodbine has been granted tens of million dollars from taxpayers in purse money by this government. Yet they continue to take action which is directly harming the Fortier racetrack. Woodbine refuses to work proactively with Fortier in the scheduling of the Prince of Wales Stakes, which would allow both Triple Crown races to be highlighted and well attended in the province. Thoroughbred tracks in Ontario should be working together. Woodbine is doing the opposite. Speaker, I ask the government to do the right thing, support horse racing in this province, and rein in this behaviour by Woodbine and Mr. Jim Lawson, the CEO. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you, you. Thank you again for, for that question. And I, our government really understands the important role that horse racing uh, industry uh, provides to uh, many in many of our communities across Ontario. In fact, a few of my colleagues who were around uh, in opposition at the time, you fought for the horse racing industry. You stepped up for all those jobs in many communities around Ontario. And, Mr. Speaker, in fact, in the member opposite's own writing, if it weren't for the tireless advocacy of my colleagues on this side of the House and then the middle over there, oh, there they are, uh, that would be countless jobs that were lost, countless uh, communities that would have suffered, Mr. Speaker. We stand with the horse racing industry. We will continue to support the house racing industry. So, thank you for your support, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> Next question, the member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Oh, Ontario knows that technology is evolving, improving, and changing faster than ever before. In many ways, it can often seem like the changes are happening more quickly than what the people and business can keep up with. For individuals, families, workers, and businesses who wish to access online services, the technology needs to be convenient and reliable. It is important and necessary that Ontario keep pace with new technology so that businesses can remain competitive and people can access the information services that they need. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to ensure that Ontario adapt up-to-date digital technology? Thank you. Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Markham Thornhill for his question. Uh, Speaker, the position of this government is very clear. As uh, Premier Ford, both Premier Ford and Minister of Finance have said it on numerous occasions, we cannot afford to be an offline government in an online world. Speaker, this mindset is driving change and innovation in government and is helping us adopt cutting-edge technologies 
like the cloud. By moving away from old, outdated tech and towards the cloud, Speaker, we are making the services that Ontarians count on more reliable, more affordable, and above all else, safer than ever before. Speaker, I'm also very proud to say that our province is not is just a, is a, is a leader not only but. in Canada but in North America as well and around the world when it comes to the adoption of cloud technology and always making sure we are delivering the best. Thank you. Process. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that response. It is a reality that cloud technology experience in, experience in tremendous growth. It's his response. The minister explained that cl cloud technology will provide an added message of safety. While this good news, we regularly hear reports from the media about security breaches, leak information, and identity theft from computer hackers. The safety and security of personal information is an important and serious issue. The people of Ontario need to be confident that our government can ensure that provincial services and agencies have a strong cyber security measures in place. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is implementing technology that will safeguard the personal information Questions. for all Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker, and again, uh, thanks to the member for his question. Speaker, as the member just mentioned in his first question, technology is evolving very quickly. Unfortunately, this also means bad actors who want to steal Ontarians' personal information are also finding new ways to inflict damage and disrupt services. Speaker, that is why our government is never letting its guard down and the added benefit of cloud technology means that we can keep Ontarians safe thanks to the improved stability, reliability, and security that this new technology brings. Speaker, as Ontario's economy and population continue to grow under our government, the need for us to keep up the pace grows as well. And under this premier and this government, we are delivering digital transformation for a smarter, more modern and efficient government Spons. that serves people and businesses of our great province. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My constituent, Robert, is on ODSB and was faced with an impossible choice at Walmart this week to buy diabetic socks or food. Every diabetic knows that proper socks prevent ulcers, infections, and ultimately amputations. So Robert's choice was really about going hungry or potentially losing his toes or feet. 85% of diabetic amputations are preventable with proper care. ODSB is legislated poverty, as we all know. Low rates means that Robert is an expert at stretching a dime into a dollar, but still, it isn't enough. When will the Premier listen to experts and double ODSB to lift people with disabilities out of poverty and to save people like Robert from losing his limbs? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for the question. Mr. Speaker, I just want to remind every single Ontarian of the decisions that have been made by this government. Mr. Speaker, we have made the largest increase to ODSB rates in decades. Further than that, Mr. Speaker, we have increased the income threshold from $200 to $1,000 so that more Ontarians can keep money, more money in their pockets. Mr. Speaker, every single decision that we've made, you'll hear time and time again the members from opposite, both parties, talk about affordability for Ontarians. Yet, when it comes to actually supporting and doing something about it, they vote against it, Mr. Speaker. It's always when the lights are on, the camera's rolling, they'll say one thing, but when it comes to action, Mr. Speaker, this is the lights, camera, no action party, Mr. Speaker. We will stand up for every single Ontarian, Mr. Speaker. We will make sure that no one is left behind in this province. That now means, Mr. Fonts. Speaker, the NDP has to stand up and tell the people of this province why they continue to vote against every single measure. Order. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker. Over a million Ontarians are being left behind us by this government. They're living on ODSB, and that number continues to grow. As reflected in their flawed budget, this government's minuscule changes to ODSB is not enough, simply not enough. When Robert is choosing between food and medical necessities, that tells me it's not enough. ODSB barely covers a few pairs of socks a year. I don't know about the Premier, but I need to change my socks daily. Why does this government insult people living with ODSB by insisting that they get a job? They're telling them to go back to work, even as the ODSB application process tells them to describe their disability in detail. Why? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable colleague again for the follow-up. Mr. Speaker, again, I just want to remind the member, here is what they voted against. The increase to support for Ontarians on the ODSB, the largest increase in decades. They voted against it. Okay. Aligning it to inflation, which as of July 1st will further increase supports for Ontarians, they voted against it. The $200 limit, which was increased to $1,000 so that more Ontarians who can and are able to work to, can get out there and earn more. Ms. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what did they do? They voted against it. Again, every single measure that this finance minister has put forward, not just in this recent budget, not in the fall economic statement, the budget before that, every single measure that we put forward to make life more affordable for Ontarians, Mr. Response. Speaker, the NDP votes against. So they'll say one thing here in the House, Mr. Speaker, but I'll assure Ontarians you have nothing to worry about. This side of the House and the majority medal will continue to. Thank you. The next question. Mr. Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Speaker, earlier this week, the minister responded to some questions about all the work that our government is doing in continuing to support the province's economic growth through new investments. These include investments in the electric vehicle and EV battery manufacturing industries, particularly with the new Volkswagen Gigafactory to be built in St. Thomas. The minister was asked about the capacity of our current energy grid and its sustainability for the long term. And I'm pleased to hear in his response that our government is addressing the, the Ontario's energy infrastructure needs through a number of different measures, including competitive procurements. Speaker, will the minister please provide additional information about Ontario's competitive procurement process for our energy Question. grid system? Of energy. Speaker, I want to start uh, by answering this question by saying um, I want to correct my record because on Monday I talked about the Oneida project, which was the largest battery storage project in Canada. But on Tuesday, that all changed, Mr. Speaker. We're going to have a larger battery storage project in Hagersville, oh. and the second largest is actually going to be in that member's riding in Greater Napanee, Mr. Speaker. Fantastic. So we're continuing this to add clean news. generation to our system as a result of the ISO's competitive procurement that came out on Tuesday. We learned that 740 megawatts of new energy storage generation is going to be available to our province. Mr. Speaker, that's enough to power a city the size of London, and it's a 400% oh. increase London. in clean energy storage. No, not, not London, England, but London, Ontario, uh, Finance Minister. I should point that out with the folks from London. Here. This is great news as our province continues to see record multi-billion dollar investments, Mr. Speaker, and we build one 1.5 million homes over the next stage, decade. We're going to need the power. Thank you very much. Question period has concluded.